Hello and welcome to Showcase, coming to you from TRT World Studios in Istanbul. Today, we're talking to the brains behind Art Dubai 2019, looking at what makes this year's show the most diverse program to date. Plus, meet the musician without a stage. Step into the crowd of Ben Frost, the Australian-born techno Viking who likes to perform shoulder to shoulder with his audience. But first. A lot of the younger generation are incredibly excited about the colour, about the vibrancy of his line. And in this room, you see them having conversations with the hero. The Tate's seminal exhibition, titled Van Gogh and Britain, explores for the first time the artist's influence, inspiration and unique connection with the United Kingdom. Vincent Van Gogh. Many people are familiar with his famous paintings of sunflowers and starry nights or as the artist who famously cut his own ear off. But the Dutch post-impressionist, one of the most famous artists in the history of Western art, also left a legacy less explored. Already the subject of countless novels, biographies and documentaries and films, you might say to yourself, what more could possibly be said about him? The answer, according to the Tate Britain, is plenty. Showcase's Miranda Atty tells us why. At Tate Britain, what's old is new again. More than 50 classic works by Vincent van Gogh have been brought together, from Starry Nights to his self-portraits, and are being shown alongside British paintings and literature that influenced him. It's the biggest exhibition on van Gogh in the UK for a decade, and the first time his relationship with Britain has been explored. London was a huge centre. It was the biggest, most modern city in the world. It was a huge centre for dissent. People were writing about social reform, about the lives of the everyday, finding this wonderful poetry and drama of the everyday. And that's one thing Van Gogh's art certainly turned out to be, was he had a wonderful sense of the poetry and the drama of the everyday. When Van Gogh was 20, he moved from The Hague to London. He would spend the next three years walking the streets, dreaming of his future, being inspired by the novels of George Eliot and Charles Dickens, by the paintings of Constable and Millet, by the smells and sounds of this city. He arrived as a trainee art dealer in 1873, working for Goupil & Co one of the most successful French art dealers of its time. And he soon fell in love, not only with London, but with British graphic art. He bought around 2,000 prints and would use these four years later to help teach himself to draw. I think a really important work to, that, to be in the exhibition was a painting that Van Gogh did right at the very end of his life. He was um, not unwell, he was living in hospital, and when he was um, not well enough to go outside and paint, he would work from prints. And so he had one of these prints he collected way back when he was a young artist, sent to him, and it was a print of prisoners uh, in Newgate Prison, it's his only London scene, and he did this wonderful oil painting from it. And it's no accident, of course, that he chose this motif because while he was there, he was feeling himself in prison, cut off from the world. The Tate is as interested in Van Gogh's influence on British artists as Britain's influence on him. Sunflowers, which is rarely loaned from its home at the National Gallery, can be reread alongside work that pays clear homage to it. In both his landscapes and his portraits, parallels can be drawn with British artists like David Bomberg and Matthew Smith. But for curator Carol Jacobi, Van Gogh's connection to Britain stretches beyond physical artworks, particularly in the aftermath of World War II. When the war finished was this wonderful exhibition um, that took place at, at Tate Britain. It's one of the first Arts Council exhibitions. And he was the perfect person for the values and the ideals after the war. It was this you know, incredible ideal of art for everybody, which the Arts Council epitomized. And he was the perfect artist to represent that for British people. So I think that what's interesting to ask, I think what we see is that Britain has sort of um, 
created a kind of Van Gogh, this Van Gogh it's needed at each historical point. And I think it's interesting to ask what Van Gogh is for us today. Van Gogh is already so famous, it is almost impossible to present this iconic artist in a fresh way. But this exhibition does just that, taking us back to a time when a young, obscure trainee art dealer first set foot in London. In this exhibit, Tate Britain takes us on the journey of how Van Gogh fell in love with Britain and how this influenced his work until his death at the age of 37. Miranda Atty, TRT World, London. Joining me now to discuss Vincent van Gogh and his little-known relationship with London is art historian Willem Jan Verlinden. Willem, thank you very much for joining us today on Showcase. Now, van Gogh has been described as the most European of artists. Why do you think that is? Well, um, of course, um, being called a European artist is also, um, uh, well, a bit of modern term. Um, uh, in times of, of Brexit, people leaving Europe. Um, but he, in a, at a very early stage, um, when uh, uh, traveling uh, by train, for example, uh, made it possible to go abroad, traveling uh, from Holland uh, uh, to England uh, by boat, of course, and to France by train, uh, uh, it gave him the opportunity uh, to uh, go abroad and uh, well he is uh, a very European uh, determined uh, artist as he um, uh, lived uh, in f five uh, uh, European countries during his life. So trying to picture what his day-to-day -day life was like in the UK I think people often forget that Van Gogh was in London just three years after Dickens died. How much of, of the sort of squalor and wealth and cruelty and poverty that we see in Dickens' writing, how much of that do you see reflected in the work of Van Gogh? Well, uh, talking about the exhibition, you uh, can see that uh, uh, very clearly uh, uh, also there uh, through the uh, prints of Doré that are uh, on display there uh, and that were a great inspiration um, uh, for Vincent in later life. Uh, to make paintings um, uh, inspired on poverty he saw in real life uh, in London. And he consumed quite a lot of British literature, didn't he? And he was a writer before he was an artist. Can you tell us a bit about his relationship yes. with literature and being a writer? So when he comes to London in 1873, uh, he already reads quite a lot. Uh, and then he... Um, um, well, he's impressed by the country uh, and uh, by Dickens, of course, uh, but he reads uh, quite a lot of other uh, uh, books from other uh, authors uh, as well. And it is the opening uh, at the exhibition. Um, uh, it's a bookshelf where you can find all copies um, uh, of books uh, that were uh, read by Vincent or uh, read by other family members, for example, his sisters, who also stayed, two of them also stayed in Britain. They say that genius doesn't go out of fashion. Why do you think yeah. Van Gogh has such a cultish following, even still today? Uh, well, uh, I think you have to start by saying that he wasn't understood at his own uh, time. Um, and. Um, uh, so uh, people just started to appreciate Van Gogh at the uh, beginning of uh, early beginning of the 20th century. Um, so uh, he came a long way, uh, and um, the reason, one of the reasons uh, he is so uh, um, famous today, is that he uh, shows everyday life uh, in uh, faces and circumstances that people even still today can relate to. Willem Jan Verlinden, art historian, thank you very much for joining us today to talk about Vincent van Gogh. Thank you. Coming up later on Showcase, changing people's perceptions of the modern art world. Showcase takes you on a trip to the neighboring UAE art hubs of Dubai and Sharjah, which are driving the art scene on the Gulf. Thank <laughs> you.
feel very um, privileged and I have a lot of gratitude for the fact that I've been able to kind of move through the world freely. 360 degrees of Ben Frost, bringing eclectic electronica to the masses. But first, let's take a look at a few other stories that caught our eye, beginning with an artist we spoke about earlier and a recent discovery about one of his paintings. After 30 years of questions, a painting that has been long attributed to Vincent van Gogh has finally been officially authenticated. Using digital X-ray technology, the provenance of the painting Vase with Poppies was verified by researchers at the Van Gogh Museum in Amsterdam. They say the painting stylistically resembles other floral paintings Van Gogh made shortly after moving to Paris. And in Iraq, after 10 years of preparations and renovations, the Basra Museum is reopening. More than 2,000 artifacts dating from as far back as 6,000 BC are now on display. This collection is significant considering many of Iraq's ancient statues and pre-Islamic treasures were either looted or destroyed following the US-led invasion in 2003 that toppled Saddam Hussein. Let's go now to a story we could call an arts-oriented tale of two cities. The first, Art Dubai, one of the few international art fairs showcasing work from Ethiopia to Beijing. The other, the Sharjah Biennial, considered a significant influencer when it comes to representing art from across the region. Twin events in neighboring cities, both uniting the global art community. The 13th edition of Art Dubai brings together the best United Arab Emirates artists under one roof, Significant given that the UAE is often neglected in the mainstream dialogue on art. This year, Art Dubai is offering its most internationally diverse program to date. However, it's got a particular focus on the global south, which we'll speak about with our upcoming guest, as well as the curator's ideas exchange program. And then there's Sharjah, the tiny emirate just north of Dubai. It's holding its 14th biennial themed leaving the echo chamber. To talk about what both of these art events are offering and what they say about today's contemporary art market is art advisor and curator Denise Chalar. Thank you very much for joining us today. Hi. And you've just wrapped Art Dubai 2019 and it was a really diverse program. Why was it important this year to make it so diverse? Well, the thing is actually Dubai, the city itself is diverse and it is home, the city is home to over 200 nationalities and it, is, it has become one of the most international cultural hubs in the world today. And uh, many artists go to Dubai to seek personal and artistic freedom, which their home countries don't offer to them. And I think in that sense, uh, it stands out with its openness and welcoming approach in the region. And I think Art Dubai, the fair, is as a reflection of the city in that sense. And were there any new sections this year? Oh yes, there were actually two new sections. One was UAE Now, and it was uh, the main focus of that section was artist-run platforms and uh, collectives. And it, I think it was a great opportunity for new young artists to get to get discovered. And the other one was, which I find quite interesting, is was Bavaba section. It means gateway in Arabic, and it consists of um, ten solo shows. And the main focus was global south. And by global south, we geographically mean Middle East, Central. South Asia and uh, Latin America, Africa and uh, it was quite interesting because it gave a true understanding of the current artistic developments in the region and it gave a um, understanding of political, social and economic structures of the region and like themes like migration and identity. You were talking earlier about um UAE now about yeah. emerging artists and yeah. um, is there one up-and-coming artist that we should be keeping an eye on this year? It's hard to say just one but I think uh, there was an there was a great interest in the, uh, carpet inspired works and I think uh, Ali Chaban for example and Jason Safety were my like favorite ones. And you've worked on a couple of shows sort of all over the world mm -hmm. what have you noticed about the taste of art collectors in the Middle East in particular? 
Uh, I think they are, they are more into the, the, the collections of Middle Eastern collectors are becoming more and more international, but I think they are more into conventional mediums like uh, paintings and sculptures. And I think they are, uh, I think like video, video and installations and uh, artificial intelligence art. The new medias are quite more like new thing for them. And uh, I think the most quite more interesting is the buying patterns of Middle Eastern collectors. They like to buy in bulk, like mm -hmm. for, let's say, in a, at a fair, a European collector might get just a piece or two, but uh, Arabs, they, they prefer getting like the whole series or like the whole works in a booth. So that's like find quite interesting. And let's talk about um, a little bit about women in art. How do yeah. you think the art scene is improving for female artists in the Middle East? I think there is a great uh, change in that sense. Um, there is this global campaign going around the world for gen gender inequalities in the arts. And I think it has a great impact uh, in the Middle Eastern art scene as well. Um, there is like so many high profile institutions like Tate and MoMA in New York are pledged to get uh, to include female artists in their collections. And for example, this team, this subject was uh, one of the major issues to get discussed in the Global Art Forum this year in Dubai as well. And, and finally, if I can ask you, do you think Dubai is well positioned to compete with other global um, art centres and art hubs? Uh, I would say it is a really good, it's a unique alternative. Like compared to London and New York, of course there is a way to go. But uh, I think Dubai is quite interesting in the sense that it is one of, it is the, for many artists, it is like a safe area in the region, especially for the artists who want to explore uh, political and social economic issues in the region. Denise Chala, art advisor and curator, thank you very much for joining us on Showcase today. Thank you. He describes his music as militant post-classical electronica. Australian producer and composer Ben Frost recently unleashed those sounds in front of an eager Istanbul crowd as part of Sonar 2019, a festival dedicated to uniting music and technology. Showcase's Adele Halim got a chance to sit down with Frost to talk about his music as well as the importance of giving his audience a 360 degree experience. <laughs> It's always interesting to me to like kind of be in a, a, a crowd of people where it's very clear that we're all coming from very different places. You know? uh, tell us about a Ben Frost show. What, what, what could someone expect? I guess what I'm trying to do, I think, is to, you know, first and foremost, to kind of like challenge myself in those situations. Like my, my, my live shows are, are um, very unscripted. You know, there's there's not a lot of, in fact, there's there's, there's no playback. It's not you know like I'm not following a, a sort of a linear narrative. So you're playing off the crowd. I imagine. Well, I'm very much just playing off like what the way I, I've sort of set my technology up is that it's thrown a lot of wild cards at me. Like it's it's I, I have to interact with it. It's very it can get very wily and it's often a little bit sort of it can fall apart pretty easily. So I'm I'm always kind of like just looking for a way through it and and also just the way it interacts with a given space you know um, the room affects me hugely obviously um, and especially playing in this in this situation where I'm you know in the in the the audience like playing in the center of the room it really changes the way I listen to it because I'm, I'm very conscious of the fact that what I'm hearing is exactly what everyone else around me is hearing it's sort of we're in it together. Exactly, you have a 360 show, so just explain what made you think of that idea and to have, you know, be surrounded by your audience. Well, I think ultimately it probably has its, its beginnings in me wanting to like challenge some of these like ideas of like what, like what performance is in, in these kind of spaces, you know, the, the, the kind of paradigm of, of electronic music performance is like constantly sort of placing people on stages above elevating the artist above the audience like it's always about 
kind of making this like delineation between the audience and the and the performer. And uh, you know, my beginnings are pretty humble, you know, like garage rock bands. And so for me, like being on the floor, like being at the same level and kind of being like in proximity to the people I'm performing for is actually something that I really get a lot out of. So I mean, I guess that's where it sort of that's where it begins. So talk about those humble beginnings. Uh, when, when you listen to your music, you hear kind of like black metal and uh, punk. But I mean, what, what are your musical influences? Well, yeah, definitely that, for sure. Um, I listen to a lot of stuff. I mean, I, I, I think, um, you know, I, I try to keep my ears open to whatever I can find, whatever kind of resonates with me, as long as it kind of has like a an emotional core to it, something that is obviously connected to itself. Um, yeah, it, it will get my attention. You know? Now you said I make I keep a roof over my head by making very questionable music. <laughs> what is it about your music that's questionable? Um, well, look, you know, I mean, you you you'll be uh, you'll be waiting a long time to hear the uh, the bass drop in my my music. Um, a lot of the time, it's uh, look. I'm I'm just trying to make something that that kind of that that feels new, that feels dangerous to me, um, and that ultimately is like keeping me kind of moving moving forward. Um, the fact that I have an audience that's willing to go along with that is is a, a constant source of fascination to me. Your first EP dropped in 2001, Music for Sad Children, uh, but since then you've moved from your homeland of Australia to Iceland. Why Iceland? Uh, well, that's the, that's the big question. I don't know, it just seemed like a good idea at the time. Um, you know, I was very young. So we're talking 15 years ago now, at this point. Um, you know, I spent my entire adult life as an Icelander, and uh, I'm very proud of that, um, you know. I don't know, these, these kind of, uh, you know, finding identity in sort of these kind of ideas of nationalism is, is something, you know, I, I, I try not to place too much weight on it. I think uh, when I say I'm proud of it, it's mostly that I, I'm kind of, uh, I feel very, uh, I feel very um, privileged and I have a lot of gratitude for the fact that I've been able to kind of move through the world freely, um, where so many people can't. And I think that that's, that's something I try to stay conscious of and, 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 and keep it in front of, my, front of my mind. And that certainly drives my work. It seems like all over the world we're talking about nationalism, borders, and who can get, come here and who can't come here. I mean, it's crazy. It's, it's a crazy time. Um, you know, the, it's it's uh, it, it's maybe like of, of, of all of the kind of um, you know all of the kind of current political climate which is kind of hammering down on people like in you know like conflict zones obviously but um, I think the long tail of all of those stories is uh, the, the the lasting the lasting uh, trauma of these situations is that we're breaking up families you know um, people are not able to see one another. And I think that that's something that's not talked about enough. Um, you know, is that as soon as as soon as you start dropping bombs on a place, people disperse and they they can't just go and visit each other. They can't jump on an easy jet flight. You know, like, um, yeah. So is it refreshing when you go to your show and you see a, a diversity of ethnicities and faces and? The of course, of course, and and moreover, I think it's like I I, I kind of see it. As like a responsibility to keep uh, to keep pushing into spaces where uh, it is kind of uh, it's it's less easy like it's uh, it's less of a given that there's going to be you know international music being performed performed there. So you've composed a score for a Palm Dor nominated film. You've also done the scoring for a few television series as well. What do you enjoy about that part of you, you know your work? I guess the storytelling, uh, like responding to an idea, responding to like, like a, 
responding to like the emotional crux of a story and just going, okay, this is what this thing is about, and then just taking that idea and running with it. You know, um, I don't I don't like to work to picture. It's not a it like it's not something that really I get a lot out of. Like, but what I do get a lot out of is the idea of of collaboration. And, and conversation and kind of feeding off the idea of an another another inspired person, you know, like a like a director and just going, okay, I'm gonna take that ID you've given me and I'm gonna see where it takes me. Thanks man, really cool. appreciate your time. Hey, thank you. Cheers. And that's it on this episode of Showcase. Don't forget you can check out our YouTube channel for more from the world of culture and the arts. I'm Mari Beveridge. Thanks for joining us. See you next time.